I'll take that uh, as license to continue. Um, I was great to see those slides of Carafran. Uh, I used to work down at Graham S. Taylor as well. Just a very quick story. I remember um, Derek Ratcliffe, not long before he died, uh, visited Graham S. Taylor. Uh, Lindsay was with us at the time. And I remember walking up the path by the side of the waterfall. And I don't know when he'd last been there, but he pointed up at a clue. Uh, just to the side of the path and said, do you know there's um, bearberry up there? And it was amazing just going up and finding it because um, I don't think it had been seen since he last saw it. I'll be mentioning him again in this talk. Um, I don't sort of have many heroes, but he comes as close to one as I've ever had. So anyway, um, this is going to be uh, pretty much me showing me holiday slides from last year. So I'll try and whiz through them pretty quick. So um, I got in June, the amazing opportunity to join a trip to St Kilda. And this was to assist with the monitoring of burrow nesting seabirds. So St Kilda is owned by the National Trust for Scotland, and it's the UK's only dual world heritage site, uh, this being for both its cultural and natural heritage. So a colleague, Paul Thompson, and I made up the National Trust for Scotland's rope access team and we were asked along to cover the monitoring transacts on the steepest ground and also to help our team members get safely on and off the islands. St Kilda lies around 40 miles to the northwest of North Uist, for those who don't know, in the Outer Hebrides. While we were there, I took the opportunity to make some botanical records on Borre, Sue, and Dune. Such records uh, were made somewhat opportunistically as the bird monitoring kept us very busy. Being small and remote islands, the flora of St Kilda isn't really exceptional, so my talk will also cover some of the logistics involved in getting to these rarely visited places. An exception to this is the St Kilda dandelion, Taraxacum panchurstianum, which was described as a new species in 2012. Sorry, I don't know why the slides are whizzing on faster than I intended. Um, this is only known from the main island of Herta, which has been relatively well botanized. And think, in fact, I think it was Jim McIntosh that collected the seeds of the dandelion that were grown on uh, for the specimens that were eventually identified. So anyway, we carried out bird surf monitoring on Herda, but I didn't actually do any botanizing on there. So this is focused on, on the other islands. The weather can be pretty unpleasant out there and um, get in the way of getting onto these islands, but luckily the weather was good uh, for the entirety of our, of our trip. So as soon as we got to Herda, we decided to get straight out to Borre, seen here. It's the most remote island in the group. Apologies for this. I think it was because uh, I pre-recorded the talk and it still seems to be sticking to those timings, um, such as the way of adapting to new technology. So I'll just try and keep switching between the slides and keep on the right one, which is the one I'm talking about. To the left of Borra Racing here, we can also see Britain's two highest sea stacks, Stack and Armand to the right and Stack Lee to the left. So we stayed on Borrowray for five nights, camping next to the cleats, which the St Kildans used when they were visiting from Herta. Known as the village, this was the flattest area of ground on the whole island, although it still meant that we were sliding around quite a lot in the tents when we're trying to get to sleep. The only decent source of water on Borrowray is beyond difficult terrain and a long way from the campsite, so we had to carry all of the water up from the landing spot. The St Kildans used a small run of water close by, but either it ran much clearer back then, or as is more likely, they were much tougher than us and had stronger stomachs. Most of the botanical records for Borrowray come from 1980, when a team visited from Durham University and, an, and numerous vegetation quadrats were recorded. Borrowray is grazed by a primitive breed of blackface sheep. These were left behind when the St Kildans evacuated in 1930, although those that they had on Herta went at the same time as them. As can be seen, they don't need to be sheared. The sheep are unmarried, living as a feral population. This means that all accessible areas are very hard grazed, with a sward of Yorkshire fog, 
red fescue, smooth meadow grass, sweet vernal grass and creeping bent, interspersed with white clover, common sorrel and common mouse ear. Blinks is common in damp grassland and runnels, where it is occasionally accompanied by common sedge. One small group of adder's tongue ferns was spotted not far above the village, and some patches of broadleaf dock have persisted around the cleats. The photo shows Herta in the background, with Sue to its left, to its right, and Dun Dun to the left. Early hair grass was found in some rocky areas along the summit ridge of Mullikanilan, which is the highest point on Borrere. And with procumbent pearlwort, it can be found wherever the turf is at its shortest. The Borrere blackface sheep are more agile than mainland blackfaces, uh, about as agile as the feral goats that you get down in Carafran. Um, and the effect of grazing can be seen in some steep places. On inaccessible cliffs, there are some tall herbs, such as wild angelica and extremely luxuriant common sorrel. This is in sharp contrast to the small leaves of this species within the grassland close by. Roseroot is rare and I only saw it in one location, while broad buckler fern and common polypody are scattered around on the crags. The canes that we're using that you can see in the picture, uh, they were quite useful for balance in such terrain, but they were actually used for measuring the distance to burrows from the transect lines of the seabirds. Sea campion is another plant quite commonly found in places the sheep can't reach. This picture shows us leaving Borrere. We rigged up a rope as the sloping rocks from where we had to jump into the rib uh, were extremely slippery with seaweed. So having something to hold on to was quite reassuring. The route onto the island ascends the sloping rocks before traversing left beneath the steep crag until the grassy slope can be reached. Plants confined mostly to the coastal rocks included thrift, buckthorn plantain, sea mayweed, common scurvy grass and Babington's orach. I never know how to pronounce that. I don't know if it's orach or orach or what, but hopefully you know what I mean. As the last one to leave, I had to remove the rope and throw it to the guys in the boat, then find an alternative way off. With the effect of foreshortening, the photo makes this look more dramatic than it actually was, but I was still glad to get to the bottom of the cliff. The wave washed ledge to the right of the rib was covered in nice grippy barnacles instead of seaweed. So once there, it was actually easy to step into the boat. After a couple of luxurious nights on Herta, our next goal was Sue, just across a channel to the Northwest. This is the least botanized of the four islands. The last visit seeming to have been made by guess who? Derek Ratcliffe in 1959. It is undoubtedly the most difficult to get to. After jumping out of the rib, the route entails climbing up the slope and crag in the middle of the picture, then ascending a steep loose gully, which had to be done one at a time to avoid hitting each other with falling rocks. At the right point, a gully that can be left by a sheep track uh, above a very steep drop until eventually a grassy slope can be climbed to relatively flat ground. I must have drawn the short straw again and was sent up first with the rope on the climb from the landing spot. With dry rock, it's fairly easy, but uh, probably about a moderate as a climbing grade, although the seaweed covered rocks at the bottom do require a bit of care. Sue is of course grazed by the famous Sue sheep, again left behind us by the St Kildans. They are even more primitive as a breed than those on Borrere. After Herta was evacuated, for one full year there were no sheep there, but in the summer of 1932, around 100 sheep were brought over from Sue by a group of St Kildans who had come to revisit their old home. This is the source of the population now on Herta, where this picture was taken. The flora of Sue was generally similar to that of Borrere, although the summit of Knock Glass was much flatter and boggy in places, with species such as Tormentil, Great Ant Heathwood Rush, and common cotton grass being present, none of which I saw on Borrere. There were also a few stems of stiff sedge at 370 metres. This is the lowest altitude at which I have seen this species, although further north it has been recorded close to sea level. 
botanizing in this area was enlivened by the presence of around 60 dive bombing bonksies, which weren't too pleased to see me. Another species found was lady fern among boulders lower down. We meant to stay only a day on Sue, but when it was time to leave, the boat operator was worried that the swell was too high, so we had to stay on the island for the night. One team member, Pete Moore, seen here on the right, was the only one of us who had been there before, having been a ranger on St Kilda in the 1980s, when it seems that they had more freedom to explore than the staff there today. The last time he'd been there, he'd been stranded with one other person for two weeks before the weather improved enough to get them off, so he was understandably nervous at our delay. As on Borrow Day, we camped next to the cleats. We'd brought tents and food in case we couldn't get off the island and left these at the top of the climb down the gully, down below the gully. Once we got the tents set up, my colleague realised he had left his down jacket down below. We hadn't brought sleeping bags, so we decided to retrieve it. After a while, I got a bit concerned that he hadn't returned, so I set off to look for him. Looking down from the top of the grassy slope, I could see him sitting above the cliffs and assumed he was enjoying some solitude and what had become a beautiful evening. When he returned, I found that he had taken the wrong sheep path out of the gully and it had collapsed beneath his feet. He had made a lunge for a protruding boulder which mercifully held fast, allowing him to haul himself back onto relatively safe ground. When I had seen him sitting peacefully in the light of the setting sun, he had actually been gathering his shattered nerves after a close call. But once the drama was over, we could appreciate the countless numbers of puffins circling above the tents, with the sun setting behind us and lighting up Herta and the more distant Borrere with a rich red glow. We were woken in the night by the arrival of calling storm petrels, leeches petrels and manx waters, making everyone glad that we had been stranded. Luckily, the next morning, the swell had died down, although rain early in the morning had made the rocks treacherously slippery. We rigged up harnesses with spare slings and lowered everyone down the steep rocks. You could see the concerned look on every face as they disappeared over the edge. For a while, they would be out of sight as they removed the harnesses and took the jump into the waiting rib. Once it had backed away from the rocks, we could see them again, and the transformation to joy and relief was obvious. It took five hours to get everyone safely off the island and all the gear lowered into the waiting boat, as seen here. We managed to drop only one tent in the sea and that was fished out again. The slope to the left is the way on and off. Unlike Borrere, the only way off for the last person was to abseil because of the slippery rocks. This time it was Paul's turn, but we had to leave a sling and carabiner behind on the boulder that we used as the anchor. So it, is an amazing place, but everyone was relieved to have got on and off safely. The final island we visited was Dune, which forms the southeastern flank of Village Bay on Herta, separated from it by a narrow channel, which once had a rope bridge spanning the gap. It was by far the easiest island to reach and had a good camping spot, although I only spent one night there. Being of easy access, it is better botanized than either Borrere or Soe. Um, I know Mick Crawley's been there and I saw him in the chat earlier on. The final island, is a, sorry, is the only island in the group which is free of sh sheep, so the vegetation is far more lush. Much of this consists of common sorrel and sea mayweed, with sea campion also common. Scots lovage was seen along the ridge in a couple of places, and wild angelica was occasional. It was the only one of the three islands where I saw autumn hawk fit. The slope we're working on here was absolutely riddled with puffin burrows, meaning great care had to be taken not to go through the roots on the way down. At the same time, every overhanging bit of vegetation harboured nesting fulmars, which couldn't be seen from above, with one wrong step leading to a stream of foul-smelling orange fluid shot in your direction by an angry bird. Thankfully, this only hid boots and trousers, which had to be banished from the tent. The chart shows the total number of species recorded from each island, with the numbers I recorded for Borrere, Sue, and Dunn for comparison. The total for Herta includes a number of ruderal species, which haven't been recorded since the St Kildans left the island. None of the plants recorded on the smaller islands does not also occur on Herta. Borrere and Dunn have probably had nearly all of their flora recorded. 
We've got around nearly all of Borrowry over the five days we were there, although it would be interesting to revisit the 1980 quadrats. Sway probably has more to find. Derek Ratcliffe's list is incomplete, and I only visited a small part of the island, although most habitats were seen. It would certainly entail a very large effort to find a handful of additional species. The only photographs that I took on the trip were a few bird blurred ones of moths and other wee beasties, such as this weevil, which was attracted in large numbers to our brightly colored tents when they were set up on dune. So uh, many thanks are due to the other team members who took the photos that I've used, and to Carl Farmer for generous, generously allowing me to use his plant photographs. Uh, Richard Luxmore organized, was the chief organizer of the trip, so much thanks are due to him as well. St Kilda surpassed my expectations. It's a wonderful place, and it was a privilege to be a part of this trip. Great. I'm happy to take any questions. I don't know. Uh, many, many thanks, Dan, for that. That was that was brilliant. Uh, I must admit, looking at those cliffs, I, I don't know if I'd have the the courage to go up them. I'll be honest with you. Uh, I remember what, what we're going to do, Dan, if you're okay, just because we're falling a wee bit behind, is it if you're all right staying around and yeah. uh, people will probably hit you with question and answers by the Q&A button, uh, either now or, or maybe towards the end. But uh, thanks very much for that. That, that was that was brilliant. Uh, guys, you've got me away.